Yeah. There's a thing over there. there. And here's a thing. Because our cable still doesn't yes, get it. I thought there was supposed to be another button there somewhere. I, 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 I always felt that that was illegal, that there was a requirement for Uh, now we have a night. Now we have a light. We should probably just start. Yeah. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Yay! Success. Very exciting. <laughs> Kathy did it. Okay. I apologize again for the delay. It's nice to have the microphones up and working, though, so everybody in the audience can hear and the people at home can hear. So, welcome to the February fourth town council meeting. If Councillor Hurley would please lead us in the pledge. Thank you. Would the town clerk please take attendance? Councilor Breton? Here. Councilor Forrest? Here. Councilor Hurley? Here. Councilor Latina is unable to attend. Councilor Lesser? Here. Councilor Rell? Here. Councilor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. Mayor Morin Bello? Here. Thank, Thank you, Dolores. Our first item on the agenda is public comment. Members of the public may speak for five minutes, please, for up to five minutes. Please come up and give your name and address. Is there anybody from the public who would like to speak tonight? Come on up. With the baby. You don't get 10 minutes because you have the baby. <laughs> Hi, Casey White, 91 Center Street. I'll try to balance here. Um, I was blocked from the police department Facebook page this weekend. And really, I'm not here to talk about that, although I think that's concerning. Um, I'm more concerned about the lack of a standard of communications across our town departments. I hear that there's a social media policy in the works that's been put on pause for various reasons and that it will be resumed once the new town manager is in place. And I urge that to happen very quickly um, because our town departments represent our town, they represent us, and I think that should be carefully considered in how that is monitored and maintained. Um, also, I think we should consider having a police commission, as we have many other commissions in town, where citizens, in a bipartisan fashion, represent the community and interface with different areas of town operations. We don't have that currently with the police, and I think that would be great for community relations, for trust building, for transparency, and for the image of our town. So that's all I have to say right now, and thank you for considering all of that. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up, Gus. Good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, what am I going to talk about tonight? The mill rate. 
uh, I was reading the, the Ray Reminder last week, and uh, I found out that basically Wethersfield has the honor to be, uh, you know, on the top with a few other towns in Connecticut. Almost 41. It's a lot. Do you ever ask yourself why? <laughs> Is it going up? I mean, does it bother you at all that it's one of the highest ones? I guess not. You know, I compare this town with Old Lyme, and somehow Old Lyme is 21 point something, 22, per, 22 mil rate, right here is 41. It's unbelievable. I have to ask why. I'm sure that there are reasons, but some of the reason probably <laughs> is that the value of the houses in Wethersfield are going down, and since I guess you can only assess the mill rate based on 70% of the value, uh, the less the value of the house in Wethersfield, the higher the mill rate. So we're getting, we getting uh, you know, hit both ways. The houses, they don't go any place. If anything at all, they lose value, and the mill rate goes up. How much longer can basically the retirees get be around here you know, in a few years on the road, might as well give you my social security to pay for the taxes. Is that what you want? I know, Tony, you, you, you look at me, but sometimes, you know, the way you look at me says, what the heck is this guy talking about? That's okay. We all have our opinions, and we all have our basically uh, right to speak. Five minutes, right? I still have three minutes. <laughs> What do we get out of here, especially the older families? My kids have been out of school for a while. And, and right now, I don't get anything at all. I cut some evergreens a little bit. I went to the town yard. They won't let me in. Says, you got to pay at least $20. Says, what? Nickel and diamond people in Wethersfield? I just have a small pickup truck. You know, I had uh, some branches. I says, okay, my wife and I, let's go there. Oh, go and see the director. He says, where does my money go? Almost $8,000 a year in the house. We are three of us. What did we do? What did we take away? Or what do we receive from the, the town? Maybe the police protection, sometimes. But the speed on my street keeps on going up. So I don't know if they're doing a good job on that. You know... The problem that the mill rate keeps on going up right here is because of, uh, I think, the money that you spend. A statistic that I heard on the radio, Fox News, by the way, says that when you take two comparable jobs, one in public and one in private, the one in public is 117%, or let me put it this way, $100 an hour in private costs $117 in public. And on top of that, if you do not behave when you work outside and you do not do your job, you get fired. In public works, you do not. There is no accountability on top of that. When I, I graduated from school years ago and I had a choice to go, you know, private or public. You know, the public never paid us as much, but the benefits were good and the accountability wasn't there. The private paid a little bit more, but you know, if you did not do your work, you will get fired. But I went, you know, and, and I chose, and I'm not, uh, I'm not, how do you say, regretting anything at all. I'm glad that I went to where I went. Okay, it's enough about the mill rate. I've been coming right here now for the past 10 years, and I always complain about this, and I always complain about that. And sometimes, I never get a feedback, and I'm not trying to to talk to you right here. But if I say something right here, right now, and it, the, it, it requires some attention, why don't you say something the next meeting or the following meeting, whatever? I mean, how long do I have to wait before I get an answer? Something else came to mind, signs. Again, Ridge Road and Prospect. There are some evergreens there. There is a sign as you approach Prospect it says, like, you know, left and right, and you can actually see that sign. I complained about two or three years ago, nothing is done yet. 
I also asked the question regarding the speed limit. How does it set it? You know, it's, can I get an idea? You know, what are the guidelines? Collier Road, a 30-foot roadway, no sidewalk, and the speed limit is 35. Is that right? Or like, you know, some, some streets have no true trucks. Well, maybe my streets should have a sign that says no true trucks. My time is up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gus. Anybody else would like to speak tonight? Come on up, Mr. Mazzarella. Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. Uh, MDC. So you have on the discussion list today a resolution uh, supporting MDC's proposed uh, rate structure for some of the work they're doing. <clears throat> Rather than providing MDC with a resolution, I would suggest you send them a letter of no confidence in their ability to manage the MDC. You go on the MDC website and it claims that we're one of their partners. We're one of the eight member towns, and we're their partners. I don't see that we're a partner of theirs at all. They pretty much tell you what they're going to do, and it gets done. I don't know why they want us to provide a resolution. Uh, I guess six of the other towns have already gone along with it. I don't see any reason to even send it in. What are they going to do, shut our water off or stop accepting our sewage? <clears throat> I think one of the basic, and okay, what they're proposing to do probably makes sense. It's going to smooth out some of the costs. And that presentation they gave was pretty hard to follow. There was a lot of information that was being fired at us. I only got a part of it. I don't know if you guys picked up more of it. But when you go to that bar graph that's in tonight's agenda, the one thing that I do come away with is, yeah, it's going to smooth out the pricing a little bit, um, combining it. But it's also going to shift the burden onto the taxpayer in their water, in the form of their water bill, rather than the ad valerum. I think the main problem with the whole system is this ad valerum methodology of, of charging for sewage disposal it just doesn't make any sense. And I think the MDC needs to move away from that system and go to a, more of a user-based type charge where uh, some towns would charge a sewer fee based on your water consumption, uh, reasoning that whatever water you take out of the tap is going to go down into the sewer. And they have some exceptions for irrigation and watering and filling swimming pools and things like that. But it brings the cost more in line with the consumption of water. Uh, you can have a property that has a fairly high value, and there may be only one or two residents in that house. You can have a property that is of a lot lower value, and you might have six or seven people living in that house. So you're going to produce a lot more sewage waste in the second case than the first. If you look at that chart, it talks about, you know, comparing the average cost of sewage disposal in the member towns. It ranges from $141 to uh, $383, with Wethersfield being second towards the top at 349 now, if you were to just average all those, it comes out to $278, which would be more realistic. If you're just averaging the cost of what, what they charge for disposing of waste amongst all the member towns. Now, if you shift it to user-based, consumption-based, it's going to shift even more drastically. And I just think that's, that's a fair way to go about it. If you're using more water and you're putting more water down the drain, then you should pay more than a person that's not. 
So I'm not quite sure how it works here. I understand we have three representatives. And I thought, based on some discussion at the last meeting or a prior meeting, that we were going to have those individuals come down here and explain why they voted for that budget. What was the reasoning? I know one of the representatives voted no. He happened to be one of three out of the 20 something people that voted at MDC on those budgets. So I don't think we're being fairly represented as, as the partner at MDC. And I hope we could uh, do something to correct that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up. Deb. Hi, Deborah Cohen, 73 Church Street. In the interest of time, I will just say that um, because I believe that there is strength in numbers, I would like to add to my support, my support rather, to um, what Casey White brought up to your attention earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else who'd like to speak? Come on up. Hi, I'm Catherine LaForza, 190 Brimfield. Uh, I am also here uh, with regard to the um, the Weathersfield Police Department Facebook page. I've started following it a few months ago, and I have been extremely dissatisfied and uncomfortable with the way that the page is managed and the type of content that is going on that page and how it represents us as a town. Um, I have and over the last uh, few days things sort of really spiraled out of control and I'm really here uh, to express my concern about uh, the police department um, using that mechanism uh, of social media to um, to make this town look like or appear as we are partisan we are divided and that um, that people can't feel safe uh, going to the police department website to get information that they're going to get propaganda. So I really recommend that we uh, institute a town-wide would be great, but at least for the police department, a social media policy that is uh, enacted and, and um, policed and, and stop the, the kind of uh, trolling that's going on there. And uh, let citizens feel uh, that the, that that service of a Facebook page is there for us as citizens, not for trolls to come and and um, disparage people or to have the content being put out by the police department be partisan. So thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Come on up, Cindy. Good evening, Cindy Zerblis, 119 to Red Highway. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read you guys a post on Facebook right now. Um, it says, "Re sisters, we need you. Tonight is town council meeting at seven o'clock. A few of us will be showing up to voice our concerns with police social media page. So many of us have been outraged by the racist comments and posts. This is our chance to shine the light on." Their page needs a social media policy that follows town employee conduct. We are hoping that by starting conversation, it will lead to change. Please consider showing up for this. We are stronger in numbers. And it, it goes on, but you know, nothing, nothing big. But what I will say, where I will agree with the woman that wrote this is, yeah, they're right. The, the, some of those pages can get a little nasty and maybe not nice and Race, I have seen racist things come out there. Um, but I will say, and I'm not going to say that any of these women that really spoke up here tonight, but there are a couple of, uh, I'm going to call them renegade members who have 
um, personally attacked people on that page, swearing at them, calling them names from that group. So they are just as guilty at it. I'm going to say that. Not all the members. It's To me, as a woman, I think it's great that that group got together, but I think there's a couple members in that group that need to be told to pipe down a little bit. Now, as far as the police department and the social media page, it appears to me that I believe we came back and spoke with you back in November about the crime, and everybody sitting in these seats here pretty much shook their head and said, yeah, we don't want this happening in our town. Yeah, we're going to do something about it. We're going to fight for our residents and make sure that these crimes don't happen. So what the police chief was doing was letting the town people know that there's a bill up at the legislator saying to raise the age. And somehow that's turned into a racist thing? How is that racist? Somebody say, to explain to me how that is racist. Now I'm going to tell you, as somebody who is a victim of a home invasion by a bunch of white boys that were juveniles, I want the age raised. That's what I want to see done. I, I, or not, I, want, it, I want it to be lowered, rather. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I take that back. But I'm just, you know, I don't understand how this is turning into a racial thing. This is not a white, a black thing. This is about doing what's right. There are juveniles coming into our town breaking laws. We need to fix that. All the chief was trying to do is let the residents know there's a bill out there. Contact your legislators. Let them know that you want, you want them to support this. Is that a bad thing? Is educating people on a social media site? It just appears that when certain people in this town don't agree with things, they get sworn at on social media, they get yelled at on social media. So personally, I don't think there needs to be a social media committee or anything like that. And as far as the police commission, I personally have gone to the chief already and told him I'd like to start a neighborhood watch, and he's told me to do my research, and I have started. I, guys, done. This has to stop. You know what? I've been a Democrat since longer than some of these people on this page have been born. This town is out of control right now. It's got to stop. Because it ain't going to bring us together if we keep acting like this. Anybody else like to speak tonight? Is there anybody else you'd like to speak tonight? Bob Young, come on up. Mr. Young, I think she called you. you come call on up. up. Yep, Mr. Young. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. I have to, I came in here late. There was something wrong with your audio, whatever this is. I think you still got a problem with it because I'm sitting back there and I can hardly understand what some people were saying. But that doesn't matter. I normally come here prepared to talk about other issues. And, uh, you know, one of the issues was, the grand, and I know somebody did speak about the, the grand list. And uh, I, I find that to be such an easy way of increasing taxes. It just, it's, it's just a person who decides whose houses are going to go up in value. And, of course, the mill rate is always there. And... Uh, it's going to clobber people. Now, it wasn't no more than uh, maybe a meeting ago, two meetings ago, when Mr. Forrest had made a comment about, well, the mill rate, if it goes up, the, um, uh, the, the, you know, the grand list goes up, the mill rate will go down. Yeah. It'll go down for a very short year or two, and then it's going to come back with the way you folks spend money and the way you keep borrowing money and you keep hammering us for more money, um, it, it's going to be right back up over the $40, and it's going to be continuing. And, and we're, 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 we're going to be up in the mid-40s within a matter of a year or two. So 
uh, whether you have ad adjustments to your mill rate or not, it's still going up and it's still costing all of us. It wasn't no more than last week I was down here to pay my tax bill. And it is just another, another bunch of money to just throw in the hole. And it disappears so fast, like piranhas are in there, eating it up. And the way you do spend money, and I object to a lot of the ways you spend money, uh, it makes it even worse. So anyway, there was some discussion also about the MDC and this agreement. Uh, I, I know they had a, a budget a couple a month ago or so that they voted on, three weeks ago, whatever. And uh, that was pretty disgraceful for all of them but one of those commissioners to vote for a much higher budget and just keep things moving upwards. And I do recall you, Mayor, you were going to write a letter to the MDC and hammer them or at least explain to them why you can't increase it. But they still did it. And I did say you know, nobody would listen to you anyway because you don't represent anybody who, who represents pushing taxes down. You, you, you want taxes to go up. Um, I've been uh, looking, continuing to look at properties in the area. And uh, of course, I sent you, you know, at the last town council meeting, I had some, uh, some uh, different transactions regarding the, the, the Roses Berry Farm over in Glastonbury, Connecticut, that was, be, that was sold, that I offered the town clerk to put into the record. Of course, she refused to, to accept my articles. I didn't write them. They came out of the Hartford Current. But then I did send all of you folks and uh, uh, probably you know, several thousand more out to people within Wethersfield so they could all get a feel as to what's really happening. And uh, last night I sent out some more. And I sent it all to all of you folks and some other folks as well um, regarding properties. And surprisingly, there was another property that popped up right here in Rocky Hill. And you all have read that, I'm sure. I'm sure you've all looked at it. Uh, 27, 27 and a half acres of, uh, of property with a very nice home on it. Have you looked at those pictures that they have on there? Beats that, that, that junky house up there on um, Highland and uh, Collier. Uh, what, 2,300 square foot house sitting on 27 acres. It's all for sale for $900,000. And here, our town council they negotiated a contract with the, sell with the sellers of the uh, Keisha farm for $75,000 an acre or $2.4 million. And it's only four miles away. And I don't understand that, Mayor. I don't understand how an appraiser, a professional appraiser, could put together an appraisal knowing that properties are not selling, <coughs> if anything, my analysis, looking at more than 40 different properties that are on the market, I've seen some where they're dropping their prices. Yet we are paying a price that's equivalent to the Gold Coast. Okay, if you would, the Gold if Coast. you would please finish up, Mr. Sure Lee, enough, and I, and I know I reminded you folks about the Gold Coast in town of Stamford, Connecticut, right on the coast. 15 acres of land for $1.2 million. Double that. That's 30 acres times $2.4 million. And here in Old Weathersfield, we're going to pay $2.4 million for a measly 32 acres of land. At, that's around $75,000 an acre exactly to what some of those properties on the Gold Coast are selling for. Thank you, madam. I'll be Thank back. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Anybody else who'd like to speak? Come on up. Megan Hartline, 19. I'm talking to the microphone. Sorry. There you go. I'm very short. <laughs> um, Megan Hartline, 19 Rosedale Street. Unfortunately, you figured out our dastardly plan to use the baby to get more time, yeah. but so I just let him stay asleep with Casey. Um, but I just wanted to say that um, I work in Hartford at Trinity College with uh, people from who live all over 
um, this area, people from Hartford, people from West Hartford, people from East Hartford, other people from Wethersfield. And I, I don't always get good comments about our town from they they hear that there are negative things being talked about on social media they hear about they hear about our town pages making partisan comments and they these are things that other people seem to know about um and it's reflecting poorly on our town um when you know i understand the previous commenter saying that they that it was a town page wanting that there were that there have been incidents of town pages wanting to bring legislation up to the community so that they know about it my instinct would be that that's not the town's place that if they're going through and they're saying here are all of the bills that are up in the legislature or even here are all of the bills relating to criminal justice that are up in the legislature that would be one thing but pointing out and saying this is a bill that we're excited about that we support or this is a bill from a legislator who's listening to us, that's different to me. Um, and so that's why I would also be in favor of um, a town social media policy, which I know that the mayor has said um, that the town is working on, especially once we have our new town manager in place. But I just want to come up and um, voice my support for that as well. Um, I think that it would help reflect very well in our town to put something like that in place and to um, have a more um, specific townwide messages that are going out that are um, I'm trying I'm trying to get away from the word controlled but I keep wanting to but having a controlled message of what we stand for as a town and what we value and so that would be um, what I would what's something that I would be very supportive of and that I would be excited and that I think would reflect well on us as a town both within um, within our town here and also in the surrounding area so thank you very much thank you is there anybody else who'd like to speak here tonight come on up Katie Sullivan, 79 Wright Road. I'm not going to go along. It's the same topic that we've been discussing, um, the police Facebook page. I'm getting to the point where it pops up on my feed and I cringe before I even read it. Um, I understand that wanting to let someone know about the bill, that's one thing. But this topic of lowering the age has been hammered and hammered and hammered on this page. It was not just that one instance. And... You know, then the comments that come back are very nasty, a lot of them. Um, I really respect our police department, so this is not an anti-police department thing. Anytime I've dealt with officers, um, they've been very professional, and I've been happy, and I feel very, very safe living in this town, and I live a few blocks away from Hartford, and I don't fear that at all. Um, but I just, I just think that... Um, having this you know opinion it's opinion it's not fact you know tell us be careful cars are being broken into make sure you lock your cars great we should you know we should make the age lower you know this is what's happening when we arrest people that's opinion that that doesn't belong there so um that's that's what i have to say i agree i know that policy is being worked on but i would just like to see something that is less opinion and more just factual information to help our town. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up, Mike. Hi, my name is Mike Lipka, 51 Orchard Hill Drive. Um, I spoke here in early December uh, after the police chief went through his reasonings and his suggestions for uh, helping to solve some of the recent crime. At the time, I commented I had a child that was the same age of the boy that uh, uh, was mugged uh, after uh, uh, a car was stolen in West Hartford and came here, and the chief said that they thought the same person also held somebody up at gunpoint three days later. Uh, and basically, his number one recommendation was to get this law changed based on his opinion and the opinions of others 
in, in similar positions uh, uh, in other towns. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, I know there's, there's a lot of emotion here. I'm looking at it from a public safety perspective. And I think as a community, we can, we can work together. I don't think there's a, a left side or a right side or a, a, a right or wrong. We have to solve the, 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 the issues of the crime. And my, my child is, my, my wife is still taking my child to the bus stop two months after, after it happened. And that's going to continue until we hear what the game plan is. And unfortunately, um, I haven't heard anything. Russ Moran, our representative, said he would facilitate a conversation. Others said they would. And I don't know if it's just me, but I have not heard anything about where we are in, uh, in taking this to the next step and getting a plan in place, except for what I see on the, on the Facebook pages. Uh, and uh, I hope as a community we can all come together and solve this. And, uh, take everybody's intent as positive and work together to, to figure it out. But we do need some communication on a periodic basis on what the game plan is, where we are. And uh, the most important thing in my view is protecting our children. And uh, um, I don't think we'll get a lot of disagreement on that. Uh, we may have different ways of doing it, but if we come together, we can solve it. So my, my suggestion is over communicate. Uh, even if there's nothing new, I haven't heard anything since December 3rd that said, here's what we're doing. I'm not even sure where, the, where we are with the, with the uh, uh, pe people that we thought did this. Uh, I just think we need to have a minimum more communication to solve, at least get people a little more comfortable. And I would just encourage people to make sure they, they you know there's difference of opinion, assume positive intent, and let's work together just to get this to a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Okay. Anybody else who'd like to speak? Okay, so public comments uh, closed. We will move on. We have a hearing tonight on a resolution in support of the MDC's integrated plan. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak specifically to the resolution? Come on up, sir. Thank you. My name is Bob Woodward. I live at 456 Middletown Avenue in Wethersfield. We've lived there for 40 years, and I would like to speak very firmly against this resolution. I'm very disappointed by the leadership in this town for even bringing it to us, but I've been disappointed recently by other aspects of the town leadership with our neighborhood, so that's nothing new. You certainly gave MDC quite a valentine in this. I live in the neighborhood that is experiencing MDC's clean water project with a sewer line that's not ours, that's coming through our neighborhood. Right now, they're more focused on the west side of Silas Dean than us, but they'll be back to finish. It brought chaos to our neighborhood. And if we hadn't stood together, we wouldn't have gotten our mail some days. We wouldn't have gotten our trash pickup some days. We had all kinds of extra cars in the neighborhood. It was not for the most part, a good experience. They did plow some snow along the barriers in front of my house, including when the town public works seemed to only be able to plow the middle of the street. And I was very grateful for that. Also, you seem in this resolution, as somebody prior to me has said, to give MDC quite an uplift in charging whatever they want for water rates which come out of our pockets and charging whatever they want for the ad valorem, which is the SOAR rates, which ultimately come out of our pocket on our taxes. Every month, our water bills go up. They keep going up, we're gonna to have to make a choice. Do we pay the taxes that go up or do we pay the water bills? I would like to see you put table this. I would like to see you go back to MDC and say, we need some guarantees of a reasonable water rate and a reasonable SOAR rate. And I would like to see you go out and explore what it would mean for us to leave the MDC. You live down where we have lived, and you will have no trouble saying that. Believe me. Go out and explore what's there for other water companies. Go out and explore what it would mean for this town and Rocky Hill to go out into the meadows and put some wells in there and start pumping our own water. I live beside a piece of wetlands. Believe me, there is water just below the surface, which with a little bit of rain comes up to be almost a lake. 
There's plenty of water out there. If you are not content to hold this back and you are going to pass it, then I request one amendment on the, on the last paragraph, the therefore, be it resolved, that the town of Wethersfield, please add the phrase minus one. To borrow from a children's poem, I may be one little soul in a great big world and I may be one little voice in a great big world, but I can be one who counts Count me for a no, and please do not take a laugh at this. Please put that in there if you pass this. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak on this resolution? Mr. Young. Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. I also say vote no on this resolution. I believe that uh, they have taken such advantage of us. But of course, you folks are partners with them in taking advantage of us. And I think everybody should really realize that. You send up three people or so to be commissioners. And how, and how do they vote? They've been voting left and right for higher spending. I guess one person didn't. But up until now, it's always been more spending, more spending, and more spending. And there's no end to it. They started off with a water project of, of a, a million something, and, and, and it just keeps, every, it grows. It grows, and I don't know why it grows. We have professionals who were at the very beginning say, this is what it's going to cost. And then it doesn't end up costing that. It ends up where it requires more money. And it brings up the thought about the professionals that have set these price, these costs. Where do they stand legally? They should be brought in. It's like our school. $80 million or whatever to, 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 to renovate our high school. And then it costs another $10 million or more or whatever it is. Did you take care of that architect and, and those people that gave you the estimates? Heck no, you, you protected them. So, you know, you're the people, you're also to blame for this. But I think at the moment, if you, so you have to write a resolution, I think the resolution should be no. And you should call back those three clowns that you have up there at the MDC, bring them in here and replace them. <clears throat> when they leave the door, they don't go back, put some new people up there, people who will do something in the rightful manner and reduce costs up there. Thank you. Vote no. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak on the resolution? Anybody else who'd like to speak on the resolution? Okay, seeing nobody, we'll declare the hearing closed. Next, we have a presentation from the Central Connecticut Health District. We have uh, Charles Brown, our director, and some board members with him, if you'd come on up. Good evening, Madam Mayor. Just give us a second to get our presentation together. Should you talk into the microphone? All right, definitely we'll talk into the microphone. <laughs> so it's long enough to get them working. <laughs> <laughs> So my name is Charles Brown. I'm the health director for the Central Connecticut Health District. We serve the four towns of uh, Rocky Hill, Wethersfield, Newington, and Berlin. Uh, I've been with the district for a little over four years now, and uh, we're going to be doing a tag team approach to our presentation tonight between myself and our new chairman, uh, Dr. Patricia Checo. Uh, so I'm going to let her start the presentation off once we get it up and running here. Well, hang on. We're, just, we're just waiting for the technical things to work. We're lucky tonight. It's up on this side, Come so on, that's Candy. good. Make it work. <laughs> okay. It's up on that side? Yep. We're up, we're okay. up here. It's up on your side? Yes. 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 Okay. Super. Great. Okay. Charlie's already basically covered the first three slides, so we'll hopefully we'll run through because we may take more than five minutes. <laughs> and uh, thank you for having us here, uh, Mayor Bellow and members of the board and our friend Kathy. 
Um, it's a pleasure to come and uh, hopefully be able to share with you some new and different things you may not have known and uh, quell any concerns you may have around changes that are being made. Um, you've seen the prevent, promote, and protect before. You know, they're just kind of our frame words for uh, what we do in public health. Uh, the four towns that make up our district are Berlin, Newington, Rocky Hill, Weathersfield. We serve approximately 100,000 people. And as you know, about 23 years ago, you and Rocky Hill decided to come together and uh, create this district. Uh, we are one of 20 regional local health districts in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and the districts actually, I have a playground structure voice, Charlie. There you go. Okay. Uh, the local health districts actually provide public health services for 1.7 million residents in Connecticut. So we are covering 47% uh, of the state. So almost all, half of all public health services are now being conducted uh, by, like, by local health districts. This is a picture of our new office for those of you who are not quite sure where it is. Uh, it's in Rocky Hill. Uh, if you're familiar with the St. Francis building, we are in the St. Francis building on the ground floor. If you're not familiar with that, but know where um, Saybrook Fish House is, you're pretty close uh, and it's fairly nearby. We employ 11 employees, nine full-time and two part-time with a, over 50 active professional and lay volunteers. And many of those volunteers come from your town and specifically are used for emergency preparedness issues and helping us run flu clinics over the years. Uh, we have oversight of a 14 member board of health made up of members that are appointed by you, the town on a population base. So we have three in Berlin, four in Newington, three in Rocky Hill, and three more in Wethersfield. Whoops, did I just do it backwards? Sorry. Yeah, I know, I got there. Here we go. So this is gonna be a little bit different from what you've heard from Judy in the past, but I would like to talk about 21st century public health. Uh, 23 years ago when you started this district, we were mostly about doing food inspections, worrying about people's septic systems, and doing those kind of regulatory environmental health things that I think most people still think of the public health department doing. Um, but it's a very different time, and so I think we need to take a quick look at what it is people get into when they decide that they're going to be a public health department, whether that is municipal or if it is a district. Back in 2014, uh, the legislature changed some of the rules about what you have to do if you are a public health department. And so I'm just throwing up here, um, it's uh, 14226 was the public act, and they pretty much said there has to be a basic series of programs and services that you provide if you are a local health department. And I left off what they said because I'd rather use a picture but we refer to these as the 10 essential public health services that everybody has to do. Let's see if our picture comes up, Charlie. One more there you go. Here we go, okay. So here you have a picture of the three functions that we have to serve in assessment, policy development, and assurance. And each of these stands for something. So we all have to monitor health status and identify and solve community health problems. Some of this is done through surveillance and investigating, uh, and diagnosing diseases and health hazards in the community, uh, and some of it is done in very different ways. We are also uh, under the policy development required to inform and educate and empower people in the community concerning health issues mobilizing community partnerships uh, and action to identify and solve health problems for persons in the community, developing policies and plans that support individuals and community health efforts. As we move to the assurance part, the part you're much more familiar with, the enforcing laws and regulations that protect health 
and ensure safety. Connecting people in the community to needed health care services when appropriate. And then we get into the business of trying to assure that we have competent public health and personal care workforces. And then evaluating what we're doing. Is it effective? Is it accessible? What is the quality? And making it all very population-based and as well, doing some research on things that happen there. I'm going to use uh, as an example something that we're all very interested in these days with what's going on in the state of Washington and the state of, of California and our own two cases down in New Haven, and that is the issue of measles. And talk about quickly the difference between a health care system, which I prefer to call a sick care system, don't laugh, Mike, because <laughs> uh, that's what it is, versus a public health system. So our doctors out there are treating one person at a time, while actually in local health we are required to take care of all of the people all of the time. So what's the health care response to a disease like measles? Well, they're the guys who actually provide the MMR to the kids and adults following pertinent recommendations and laws. And in this state, we do still have laws uh, about requiring all children entering school to have their vaccinations. They are also the ones who diagnose and treat the cases, and whether we like it or not, this happens to be a disease that once you got it, it kind of runs its course. There are no magic pills. There are no real interventions. And they also are required to report that disease to the state and local public health folks who have to do certain things when that happens. By the way, I also want to tell you the only disease we've actually, the vaccine-preventable disease we have eradicated in the world is smallpox. Despite the fact that we have all of these vaccines, we still can't seem to get rid of them all. So here's our public health response examples. Obviously, the public information campaigns and trying to convince people of the importance of vaccine-preventable diseases. Um, very quickly, I know how old I am, but is there anybody up here who's actually ever had measles? In the audience? Yeah, we're, we're oldies. So, <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, when people don't see it, they don't think it really exists. We have to respond to all reported cases within our jurisdiction. So once that comes out that there is a case of measles, there's a whole lot of follow-up that has to occur. And obviously you're seeing it when you read about it in the paper with what's going on in New Haven, trying to find out where those people have been, who they've exposed, how many people are at risk, and what other possible things happen after that. If it becomes a real crisis, we would be the ones who would employ targeted and or mass vaccination clinics in response to the outbreak. We don't really, hopefully, see that happening with measles, but it certainly is what we do with emergency preparedness when we have to be ready, as you may remember with the smallpox issues of perhaps having to vaccinate our whole community in a three or four day period. And we have to promote policies and laws that require vaccination of children at various ages and to enter school. And finally, part of our job is to really inform and assure parents of how the vaccine works, the need for herd immunity, and the efficiency and safety of these vaccines. And finally, to assure and evaluate coverage, we'll do surveys. Some of you don't realize this, but every year our school nurses are out there looking at all the records of all the kids in our schools and giving us an idea of what our percentage is of kids who have had all their vaccines and have not. Um, before we move on here, I just want to talk about the fact that we do a lot that is related to what we call PSEs, 
changing outcomes and preventing, promoting, and whatever through the use of changing policies, changing systems, and the environment, which includes both our fixed living environment, but also the greater environment that is our social norms, that are our behaviors. And social determinants is a word that we've thrown around for 50 years, but the public's now beginning to realize these social determinants are out there. And the healthcare transition and transformation, transformation stuff is actually beginning to look at making changes that change outcomes in the health of people and their lives. Um, so your health department wants to be an integral part of that, wants to be an integral partner, since we've heard a lot about partners tonight, with you and the community. Charlie will be talking about how we finance it, how we make it happen. And I thank you for your role already in the opioid initiative. And we're very excited about all working together to see if we can change that for people's lives. Thank you. Board oh, board thank members. You. I went right back. OK, I am sorry. I'd like to introduce your board members from the town of Wethersfield. Uh, they are important colleagues, friends, and contributors to the local uh, health board. Uh, first, there's Deborah Hinault, <laughs> Anne Marie DiLoretto, and our brand new member, thank you so much for appointing her, uh, Jen Hill, who will be at our first meeting. So thank you again for your continuing support, and certainly Charlie and I are here to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to speak at light speed to go through the rest of this. The finance is very okay. good. <laughs> so uh, I get to talk about the bottom line, which is always a fun thing to start off with. Uh, so 2017-18, which is our most recent audit, uh, we had a little bit of revenue, a little bit over $1.1 million, and that was split between the town contributions per capita at 575, uh, program revenue, uh, and then uh, grants and totaling a little over $300,000. Our expenditures were a little bit over $1.1 million as well, and that really the majority of those were the salary and benefits. We don't make widgets. Uh, our, our function is to serve the community, so really the majority of our expenditures goes into uh, paying for the people that actually provide those services. Uh, we had some professional contracts, and then our program and operating expenses at about $127,000. So Pat talked a little bit about the 10 essential services. I'm going to dive into this. I wish I could have people walking into the pharmacy and asking for an ounce of prevention. That would make my job much easier, uh, especially if they would provide it. Uh, they are doing a little bit of their part uh, with respect to providing vaccinations, but you know it really would be great to just get an ounce or a pound right away. Um, so speaking of vaccinations, we do provide uh, influenza vaccinations. Last year we did a little over 2,000 flu shots. Uh, our average time from the front door to the back door is about three minutes. Uh, I know many people have taken advantage of that. Uh, we use this as an opportunity to really test our plans and really work within the community to provide that uh, important vaccination coverage. Uh, in addition to that, we do disease follow-up for other diseases like hepatitis A, B, and C, uh, salmonella. We do follow-ups with lead poisoning for children um, and really look at all the vaccine preventable diseases and things like Legionella. Um, in addition to that, we also get involved in vector-borne diseases uh, like mosquito and tick-borne diseases. Uh, many of y'all here, when, uh, when the reports of West Nile virus come out, um, we have a testing station here in Weathersfield, and so we like to get involved and make sure that people are aware of what to do to protect themselves from West Nile virus, from eastern equine encephalitis, things like Zika, which fortunately we haven't had to see in our four towns, but it's something that we keep an eye on. And then those tick-borne diseases like Lyme. Uh, as Pat mentioned, we have been very involved in the response to the opioid crisis. Uh, we've been the convener for local agencies within our four towns uh, for the past almost two years now, over two years now. Uh, we had our third stakeholder forum in July, uh, on, and we currently have work groups of volunteers, people within the communities uh, that actually are working on prevention, response, and recovery. Uh, I do have the pleasure to announce that we were awarded a two-year grant from the Department of Health, uh, Mental Health and Addiction Services uh, to work with uh, persons suffering from addictions and their families. Uh, so we got a two-year grant for $150,000 over that two years. So we actually are doing a, a lot more and have the resource to be able to, to really help just tackle this particular issue. 
Uh, how we protect against environmental services? Well, we do have inspectors that do a lot of inspections, over 1,700 inspections over a variety of the agencies that we regulate, and you can see the numbers there in front of you. Uh, our inspectors work very hard, they work as a team, uh, and they really do uh, assure the protection uh, from environmental hazards. Uh, respond to a number of complaints. Last year we did 221 complaints. The majority of those were housing and property maintenance related, uh, in addition to hoarding complaints. Um, as you can see from the pictures, uh, when you walk into one of these situations, it can be quite involved. Uh, it usually takes a team approach working with social services, with building, uh, and, and just trying to take, take the time to be able to address the issues as you see them. Um, one of the issues that we see within all our communities is asthma. Uh, we have our Putting on Airs uh, program, which has a team approach where we actually go into uh, patients' homes that are referred to us. Uh, we do home visits with asthma patients to be able to look at um, their environment, what their triggers are, uh, having an uh, asthma health educator that goes over their um, asthma control plan to be able to look at their medications and be able to educate them on those things. And that's been a tremendous success. Other environmental hazards that we protect against, we actually do radon kit distribution within our, our agency. And lead poisoning prevention has been something that's been very important here recently. Uh, we've had a lot of outreach to rental properties uh, within our four towns. And we just want to let people know it's not just peeling paint anymore that you see like an old weather field where you're re rehabbing a, a house. Uh, we see a lot of things like jewelry, spices, toys, and even pressure cookers, as you can see here. Uh, we've actually tested and found that the lead in the seal for the pressure cookers uh, in there that people use every day. And a lot of our uh, residents are really unaware of that. But we do that type of investigation, try to find the source of the lead and eliminate it so that we can lower those lead levels within the children. Preventing injuries, we sell bike helmets. We're probably one of the best deals you'll ever find for a bike helmet as a warm days as we have today and tomorrow. I know kids are thinking about those bikes. Uh, Ten bucks for a bike helmet is not a, a bad deal at all. And we encourage everybody, if you're riding your bike, wear your helmet. Uh, we've been providing a lot of reminders on Facebook and our page, uh, trying to get people to understand uh, some of the risks that they, they could be exposed to. Um, promoting and encouraging healthy behaviors. Uh, we're in the fourth year of our walking competition. Uh, last year, Berlin won the overall competition for 2018, and Rocky Hill won the Impact Award for the highest participation. They took that away from you guys. <laughs> you guys won the Impact Award the first year. Uh, we want to see you all actually take it away from them. Uh, so I encourage all of you to get your teams together. We're going to start here in April uh, once again for the walking competition. So if you're, if you're not thinking about that, especially on days like today, get out there, get moving, get walking uh, so that we can really uh, hit this hard in April. Um, other, how we promote other healthy behaviors, we have our li Living Healthy in the District Guide. Uh, we do training sessions on a variety of issues throughout the year. In our new uh, facility, we actually have a room to be able to do those training sessions uh, in-house but we actually go in the communities. We work with you. And I'm really excited to be able to say that we're working with Weathersfield on their bike and, and walk plan. Uh, we've had sessions with the Complete Streets, working with the town planners, working with Bike Walk Weathersfield folks, and really trying to bring that policy change down to the community level. And we're excited about that, having a plan in place, uh, hopefully here in a couple months. Uh, tobacco use cessation is another uh, policy issue that we look at and probably going to be working on much more with things like vaping and e-cigarettes and things of that nature. Uh, responding to disasters, as Pat said, uh, our flu clinics, we treat them as opportunities to test our plans. We have wonderful volunteers uh, that actually help us do that, uh, but we test our plans every year. We, I believe that we are probably one of the most prepared districts because of the way that we actually test those plans. In addition to the flu clinics, um, you know, we also have plans that deal with flooding and other natural disasters and how we would work with the town departments to be able to uh, really respond as needed. Um, assuring quality of health services, we actually provide senior dental screenings. Uh, last year we provided 117 clients, uh, seniors, free oral health screenings. And that's so important as we age to be able to take care of our oral health because it is indicative of our overall health as we get older. It's, a, it's very, something very important for us. How we prepare for the future, uh, we're, con we're continuing to look at the National Public Health Accreditation uh, as we move, as we actually get together doing more quality improvement. Uh, we are doing a code revision for our sanitary code uh, based on the adoption of the FDA food code here. Um, so we actually are, are doing quite a bit in this area. Last two words are thanks. 
I can't say thank you enough uh, to our member towns, you are public, uh, for your continued support, and we stand ready to answer any questions that you might have. And that was light speed for a southerner. I just want to let you know. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Councilors, are there any questions? Councilor Hurley. Thanks. Um, we've seen <coughs> similar presentations the last time. Oh, oh yeah. Years. I mean, we, we, we brought it back. We're going to change it up next year for you so okay. y'all. No, that's fine. I mean, we see what's <laughs> happening. I just, last year when you came, you were going to combine everybody into one building, mm -hmm. but that cost was going to cost us more. Um, but we didn't like agree with the idea, but you guys still went and did it. So how does that work? I, I guess I don't understand how you move when a council does, isn't in agreement with doing that. Well, our, our budget is actually set by the board. Um, so our board is a governing board. Um, so they represent you and the representatives that you actually have are the ones that go through that process. We have a similar process for our budget uh, where we have public hearings. We have to be able to uh, provide that information out to the public. And, you know, we really do try to be able to provide as, you know, the best, most cost effective services that we can as a public health agency. Okay, I get that. It was yeah. just. How, we, were, how did, we were going to increase costs by moving, like almost like regionalizing all our uh, all the towns into one building. And usually, when people think about regionalization, it costs you less money. So it just didn't make the council at the time feel very good. Yeah, I mean, what I will say is that on the whole, we had to really make a decision. Um, and we had to weigh in the balance the cost that we would have to implement certain things like the FDA food code that's coming up here. And in our current or in our previous um, situation, uh, we were looking at the, having to add staff. And staff, as I mentioned in my presentation, really do or is the majority of what costs us money. Um, so having to add a sanitarian specifically uh, to be able to deal with the additional workload that we were looking at. So, the cost for that really looks somewhere around, just for the sanitary itself, salary and benefits, uh, close to about $90,000. So the move that we actually did was much less than that. Um, so we actually increased just our operating expenses uh, somewhere close to the tune of about $60,000. So one of the main things that we had to do prior to moving to our board uh, was to justify and make sure that we were going to be, at the very least, cost neutral. Um, so that was one of the things that our board provided oversight for, and we did a lot of justification, a lot of uh, actually working with the town managers to explain this process. Okay. Um, thank you, and I do look forward to looking at the budget in more detail in two, for 2019 in a few months. Okay. Deputy Mayor? Uh, two things. Charlie, uh, first you said that uh, you have public hearings on your budget. Mm -hmm. I assume you show them, you you publicize them yes, sir. Uh, locally. Yes, sir. But uh, my suggestion would be for the benefit of the taxpayers in the various four towns, if you could forward your budget sessions uh, to the four towns so they could be put on our website, which is what our residents team to look at more than your site, uh, yeah, they would know. So if they want to come in and listen and, and voice their objections or acceptance, they yeah. could be able to do that? Yeah, we, we would definitely be able to do that. And we actually are required to post, according to the Freedom of Information Act, post our meetings just the same way that you guys do. So we don't just post to our website. Uh, we actually send it to each one of the town clerks so that it gets posted uh, within the towns. It gets on their websites. It also um, gets put in the paper um, so that we try to provide as transparent of a budget process as we possibly can. Okay. And could you just give us a time frame for your budget process so everybody knows? So our budget process, we actually have two, two things that are involved with our budget. One, for the towns uh, that we serve, we have to actually have the per capita cost uh, to you by April 30th. And then we have to pass our budget uh, no later than the end of June. Yeah, so one thing that has, that has kind of held up uh, our budget here in the past few years has been... Uh, union contract negotiations and we're in a contract negotiation year this year uh, so you know we probably are going to be closer to that June time frame but we will definitely have the per capita cost to the towns by that April 30th no later than that and so your public hearings are when 
Uh, it depends. I mean, most of the time we are probably going to be May time frame, Pat, um, is when our public hearings for our budget usually go. So then you, you create your budget, give us the per capita numbers, then you hold your hearings and adopt yep. after we've adopted our budget. Yep. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Other questions? Councilor Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. <laughs> See you again, Charlie. Hey, how you doing? Good. Um, one, I'm going to follow up a little bit on what Councilor Hurley was talking about. What was the, um, the reasoning behind the move from this particular building to the new facility? If well, you there, there were several reasons for it. Um, one was the addition of staff, um, either having to add staff or use our staff more efficiently. So the way we were structured before was we had five separate offices, uh, one in each one of the town halls and an office in the Newington Senior Center. Um, so being able to centralize our staff really does allow us to be able to work more efficiently. Uh, people can support each other. Um, there's not the time it takes administratively to be able to handle things like um, just supervisory support. Uh, so just having the staff in one central office, we've already found um, that there's benefits behind that. Um, additionally, some of our um, office space within the town halls was not ideal. Um, we as a public health agency, we need to be accessible to our res residents and in some of our town halls, we were not. There were stairs, there was not a way for our people to get to our staff there. Uh, additionally, some of the staff, um, area was not ideal. Uh, air quality issues in some places. Um, so we really were looking at how we could bring our staff together, how we could um, provide more efficient and effective services and be cost effective and continue, you know, our run. Do you think was the was the was the major driver the fact that you had people in different locations and you you want to centralize? Because I think that the air quality, I mean that that's like an ocean thing. I mean that, Well, I mean it, but like I said, it's a combination of factors. The yeah. main the main thing was actually being able to efficiently use our staff. Okay. Because the difference between trying to add staff to be able to perform the functions that were mandated to do and then not having the room in the in the spaces that we were to really be able to have any staff. So it was a challenge. Got it. Uh, the second thing I, I question I had is, can you go back to the slide that has just the number of allocated board members? Uh, it, was, it wasn't necessarily in your presentation. I'm not sure if it's the same presentation. Oh, yeah. 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 Let me just get back there. Right there. So um, this, this, I was curious. Um, when I look at the, the populations of the particular towns, uh, Berlin and Rocky Hill are almost about the same size, about 20,000. We're at almost 26, 27,000, mm -hmm. and Newington's about 30. So it seems to me like we would probably, the makeup of the board would be that Wethersfield would have four board members. It would be more logical according to population. Is there well, a reason for that? It's actually set by statute. So by statute you get, and, and correct me. So, so, so as 26,000 for the town of Wethersfield, you'd get two, one for each 10,000, and then the additional one, three, for that 6,000. So because Newington had reached the 30,000 30, and people, above, even just, if they went over five people, they would have that fourth representative. All right. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> so it's a technicality, but it understood. Yeah. Effort. Well answered. I understand the concept now. Okay. So you got to bring some more people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the I will say I will say this. Sure. Y'all are very well represented on our board. And, oh, sure. And and now that we have a full complement of, of Weathersfield uh, board members, um, they really do provide the oversight uh, for us from your town's perspective. Um, the next one was the question I had was uh, last we talked we did talk about the possibility of expanding and I know that lots of times we're looking at consolidation of services and Cromwell certainly is sort of that thing that sticks out when you look at a map. I think they have their own. Yeah, and we actually, we actually did, uh, were approached by Cromwell yeah. um, to provide a proposal for services. Uh, we did put that together, provided it to them, and they chose not to go with the district at that time. Uh, so, you know, it's a lot like a dance. Um, you got to have both partners dancing in the same sheet of music, and it has to be a win on both sides of the equation. When, uh, that, when did that occur? Um, we actually put that proposal in probably eight months ago. Okay. Yeah. Now about other towns, have we reached out to them to look at some combination and 
when you again when you look at the map there there's there's not a lot of towns around the area that that we can reach out to uh to be able to make that happen um we are open to expansion as you know as it comes up and usually that happens at a time of change cromwell for example um they had their health director that was getting ready to retire so they were trying to look at what their options were which was one of the reasons why they they reached out to us um, and then a lot of times there may be situations where a health district or a town um, is looking, you know, just to see if there's a better match. Um, and there may be opportunity there. Um, we really do try to look out and see what, how we can provide and expand our services. Uh, I will say this, I think that the idea of regionalization is still out there at the state level. Um, there's probably going to be more conversation about this and health districts are part of that conversation. Uh, we as a health district are one of the most successful models of regionalization of keeping cost downs um, that exists within the state of Connecticut. Um, so we've been having health districts since the 60s, Pat. So um, being able to serve as a regional level. So, I mean, we, I believe, are open to that, Pat, and I think we'll, we'll continue to be. Okay. And then there was another um, slide that talked about garbage and refuse complaints. And mm -hmm. I was wondering how that is uh is looked at vis-a-vis -vis, you know if we just have sort of blight ordinance and and litter laws and so on and so forth how is how does your how does the health district sort of interplay with the rest of our laws relating to trash and ref garbage and refuse seven percent like that's actually a real number yeah so seven percent of our calls come in on garbage and refuse and really when we're looking at those types of things uh it revolves around unsanitary conditions that the garbage may provide or harborage of, of rodents or insects. Um, so from a public health perspective, we're looking at those vectors of disease and whether or not the unsanitary conditions like the, the garbage uh, would contribute to that. So is that like complaints that would be almost from like a town where you might have town staff that are going around there? Is it, is it people? We, What's the resolution? How does that work? Well, we, we take complaints really from anyone. So we may get uh, situations that get brought to us by town departments. We may have uh, residents that call in with a complaint. Uh, once they get, do get called in, we actually do send one of our inspectors to investigate. Um, so we take a look at it, and complaints are one of the most time-intensive things that we do uh, because each one of them is pretty unique. Uh, we may end up uh, being able to work with the person that has the issue and resolve it fairly quickly. Uh, but we have had situations where we had to work with state's attorney's office to be able to really turn things over to them uh, to where they, they take legal action against um, the violators. So... Um, it is an intensive process, uh, but really what we're trying to do is to um, enforce the public health code. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> I had one more question for you, Charles, and that's okay. regarding uh, the flu clinics. Yeah. I got this question posed to me this week, and I figured I knew you'd see here tonight, so I saved it for tonight <laughs> instead of okay. calling you. Okay. Uh, I was told by somebody this weekend that there's two different strain, uh, types of flu shot. There's a regular and there's a stronger version, mm -hmm. and that the health district used the regular version and not the stronger, and that you know seniors especially should be getting the stronger. So my question is, you know, is it a fact that there's two, and which one should we be using? Well, there's actually so there's position? actually more than two, uh, okay. but I'll, I'm, I'm going to throw this over to Pat a little bit. But I will say, um, what we use is a quadrivalent vaccine, which covers four different strains of the virus. So it provides a broader spectrum of coverage against what could be circulating out there. Um, the high-dose vaccine that's been re coming out here recently is a trivalent vaccine, so it only really provides coverage over three different types of influenza. Um, we make a judgment call. So. Well, we don't really make a judgment well, call. We, 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 as we provide it. Yes, but we, we make, uh, we follow the CDC recommendations. And uh, I'm in the same ballpark as you. My immunity's waning. <laughs> and so we want to get the best bargain for us. As Charlie said, the quadrivalent has four different strains that you're covered for. And the other one only has three. So there's a good market out there to seniors trying to tell you that it's the stronger, better vaccine. But take it from another old person, I'm taking my quadrivalent. Uh, and so, you know, we're not CVS. Right. And I doubt if you could walk into CVS either and say, gee, I don't like that one, could I get the other one? Uh, 
So the, the judgment is made based on uh, state recommendations, the Center for Disease Control recommendations, uh, and that's how we come up with the quadrivalent. So technically, with you giving out the four, you're giving out the, the stronger of the two. The stronger, the, the stronger is the four. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I want to have, be able to get that back to that person, so that's why I have. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councilor Bell. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, let's see, where are we on this? If you probably go back a couple slides, I had a question about the per person uh, town contributions. Okay. Yep, right there. Yep. 575. How that, long has that been set? Well, that was in 2017 18. The current for 18 19 uh, is actually at $6. Okay, so it's going to go up. Well, and yeah, Mike, yeah, yeah. remember this is last year's yeah. report. Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> So, so we take the audited numbers from our from our most most recently completed audit. That's what we provide the numbers for. Our current per capita is six dollars. Okay, um, and then you touched on it's not in a slide, but you commented on the. I think you have nine employees, two part time. We, we have eleven employees, nine full time, two part time. And um, you had mentioned union contracts. Yes. Where are you in negotiations with that, or, or where are you in contract? We're just starting. We have a, had a four-year contract. Uh, I was lucky enough when I took over to step right in the middle of the initial contract negotiations. Uh, we had a four-year contract, uh, so we're currently at beginning renegotiating that contract. And I know you're not at liberty to say too much about that, Thank but you. are all nine full-time employees uh, on? No, um, actually, we only have, um, I think it's six positions that are covered by our collective bargaining unit. Okay. And um, at this time, are they looking to uh, renegotiate to include more or? That's always an option as far as with the union. So, you know, that is something that they, they look at. Currently, they, they have not expanded over the four years. I'm not sure if they would choose to do that. Um, they're fairly focused on the environmental section. Um, so, you know, we'll have to, have to kind of wait and see. And as you know, they got to get somebody to sign a card. Mm -hmm. so. And when we are uh, negotiating or discussing our budget, obviously the health district's budget plays a factor in that. Where mm -hmm. would you be with negotiations at the time that we are starting to, I mean, I think we have to approve our budget by May 15th. So we're going to start negotiating. It ho hopefully will be completed. Um, it took us quite a while to get our initial contract in place because we had to establish a contract. Um, so this time, hopefully we don't have to go down into the minute detail that we had to initially. Uh, but, you know, once again, it opens up everything for negotiation. Okay. Um, but, you know, as I said, for your um, budget pieces, uh, we have to have our per capita to you by April. Okay. April 1st or? Is... April 30th, I believe. Okay. But, I mean, we, we really do try to get that yeah. to, to the towns as early as possible because we know that y'all are planning for your budgets as well. Mm -hmm. And then just looking at, you know, the quick math of $6 over top of, you know, five seventy-five. I'm not that good. I can't even come up with uh, how much that would be. Five sixty divided by five seventy-five. You're talking about, yeah, just roughly a hundred thousand. You know, not well. You guys had it in there, ninety-eight thousand mm -hmm. residents. Yeah. So a hundred thousand. So, so for, for so so just as a quick rule of thumb, because we're close to a hundred thousand, uh, for every ten cent per capita raise, it's ten thousand dollars in budget. Yep. So we're talking twenty-five thousand increase, and then. That is on revenue side and on expenditure side. Expenditure side. The next slide, one million one ten. What are you guys looking, projecting? I know I'm asking like. Uh, you're asking me to get my crystal ball out. Crystal ball, yeah. <laughs> and and really our expenditures, we tried to keep those down to a minimum, um, just as as any public agency does. Um, that being said, you know the cost of doing business goes up. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be able to cover those costs. Uh, we have done some restructuring with respect to our grants uh, to be able to have those cover more of our operating expense, expenses than what they have in the past. Uh, so we're really trying to do some rebalancing in how we actually cover our overhead. 
Um, so we're trying to really make sure that we uh, limit the impact to our towns, you know, for the things that we do. Uh, that being said, you know, that per capita charge of six dollars, um, if one of the handouts that we handed to the town council was a history of all uh, since our beginning. Uh, and if you looked on the back of that, um, it shows all of the health districts and what they charged uh, last year. So last year we were at 575 and we were at the bottom third of the health districts within the state. Um, at six dollars, we'd still be in the bottom third mm -hmm. of the health, di health districts in the state. Um, so six dollars per person per year to provide the, pu the comprehensive public health services that we went through today really is a heck of a deal. Okay. Well, I do appreciate it, and uh, I think uh, definitely not only with the health district, but with everything else that's going on with the budget come uh, um, this springtime when we're really delving into it, we'll be taking a you know a look at it, and hopefully we can find some places to save, um, and uh, you know not impact not only the health district but uh, the residents of the four towns. Yep, and okay. and that's as I said, that's one of the things that we do really try to do as a health district, and to be able to provide the most cost-effective public health services that you can find. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments tonight? Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation and for coming Thank you. tonight. So we'll do reports. Um, okay. As long as, as long as they can see us, um, we have reports to do first, Kathy. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to keep the screens down because I think the next presentation, we're going to have another presentation momentarily. So um, bef thank you. Before then, we do have reports from boards and commissions. Are there any council members who have reports tonight on boards and commissions? Councilor Lester. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you may recall a couple months ago we formed the Veterans Commission Town in December, and we I mentioned this at last meeting. We are partnering with Weathersfield High School to uh, have a 75th anniversary of D Day, which will be on June 6, 2019. Um, I do want to read you kind of what the plan is, and I want to give the credit to the high school, two, two teachers, and bear with me, it won't take that long, I'm going to put my glasses on because I can't see, but uh, John San and Ann Trinkus, they are uh, helping lead this, and we're partnering with them in the Veterans Committee, but here's uh, the highlights of the program, which I hope many of our residents can go, and again, it will be on June 6th, Thursday morning, the exact 75th anniversary of D-Day. Uh, it will be a 20-minute advisory period in which freshman and sophomore classes will watch a short video on D-Day. The junior and senior advisories will have the opportunity to hear a veteran speak about his or her experiences. The entire uh, community will proceed to the athletic field where the program will continue. There will be musical interludes, both vocal and instrumental, performed by our students. Student representatives will speak about the role that each branch of the United States Armed Services played in the liberation of Europe. The program will conclude with com comments from World War II veteran, Mr. Daniel Camilleri, and then the program will close with the playing of TAPS. So this is just one thing that the town's Veterans Committee is involved in. And again, it emanated from the school system, and we have partnering with them, but I want to keep you guys posted on this and other things that the committee is doing. And again, June 6th, um, Thursday morning, 2019. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other council members? Councilor Hurley? Um, I just had something to say about the police department. Um, it was a couple months ago that we had the, that the mayor asked the police chief and our legislatures to come down. All four of them actually showed up um, to discuss crime because we had some crime going on. And there was a lot of discussion about moving the ages for youthful offenders back to where they were like five years ago. Um, two of the legislature supported it. Two of the other ones wanted to find out more information. Shortly after that, the police chief did put information up on a law as soon as it became available. And I didn't see anything like, I didn't see anything against it. 
Um, I didn't hear that we were going to have a Facebook policy. This is the first I'm hearing of that. And I, want, I would like to be involved with that because I'm not a big proponent of censorship. Um, just to comment on that, there, it's not a Facebook policy. There's a social media policy that the town staff had been working on um, back in the spring. Is that when, when did that start, Kathy? It, it started um, actually in the fall. Well, the summer, summer into the fall. Because it started, it, it had started, I thought, before the previous town manager left. Is that not correct? There was some discussion on it, yes. Okay. Okay, I don't think it ever got brought up to the town. No, it council. hasn't. It's still in, it's, it was being worked on at the town staff level. Yeah. Well, this is the first time that I've even heard about mm -hmm. it. Um, and I did, I, the, um, our representatives, our a legislative delegation is working on <clears throat> um, finding a date for a community conversation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They have mentioned both February 26th and 27th. Um, and like I said, they are working on that now to find a room and make sure all four of them will be available. So those dates are not set in stone yet. Um, but I did receive those dates this week that they are trying to have another community conversation on those two dates. One of those two dates in, in somewhere in town. Excuse me, Mayor. Is that on this issue or is it on any community? It's on any. It's just a community conversation on any issue. Any member of the community would be able to come and speak to the legislative delegation about their concerns. Thank you. Thanks for having me clarify that, Kenny. Go ahead. Uh, just, <clears throat> just to clarify things a little bit, uh, Mike, uh, EDIC had wanted to set up a Facebook page just to bring forward what was going on in town and stuff. And before they did, the, you know, the previous town manager wanted to get a policy in place so all departments were on the same page. So staff has been working on it. Uh, once it's finished, it would you know, go through our town attorney first, and then it would come to council for review and comments. So it wasn't that we were being left out of it. It's just something that staff has been working on so they could present it to us. So uh, I just wanted to give you some of the history of why it's in the works. All right. Usually we hear about like larger things like that, but that's okay. Are there any other council reports? Not a report, but kind of to follow up on that and, and to Mike's conversation, uh, now, would this be for social media pages that are run by departments like the library? WAC. Yep. The but old then, Elm, the, the you know, EDIC. But EDIC is made Elm. up of volunteers. <laughs> uh, I mean. But they're, they're the ones who are now, um, I don't want to say in charge, in charge of the Great Elm website. So it would be for something like the Great Elm. I'm just worried if we're going to go down this route that we're going to, you know, th this this body as well as a number of other boards and commissions are made up of volunteers. So when you start to inject yourself as either a public servant or as a private citizen, it it kind of muddies up what your comments are. If I was to comment on the police department's Facebook page. <coughs> As a this regular. is pertaining to posts. What you, if you're an administrator on the town of Weathersfield's Facebook page, one of their pages, mm -hmm. you're an administrator. You're posting to those pages the social media um, proposal, the, the regulations or guidelines would pertain to that. What what you're posting and and um, what's appropriate use the of content the pages. going out mm -hmm. rather than. The conversation going back and forth. Well, it does also pertain to comments, and I think even the police department's page has it right on the page that the police department will remove comments that are um, deemed inappropriate by virtue of A, B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, if you put something totally inappropriate in a comment, uh, an administrator on that page would be able to remove it. So there would be some removal of comments. Okay. And I can have, I can ask Kathy um, to send the draft out because I have seen a draft of it, um, but it's it's a draft. I mean that okay. Peter Gillespie is was working on it with others. Okay. 
Any other comments? Well, to kind of go along with that, um, I read on Facebook the other day, as many others have, about the James Francis House, which is a property owned by the um, Historical Society in Old Weathersfield on Hartford Avenue. Yes. Uh, they are uh, planning to sell that. The Historical Society is planning to sell that building. Um, I am you know, not only a member of the Historical Society, but as a liaison to uh, the society, I am going to you know, keep an eye on this uh, sale, a pending sale or you know, proposal to, to sell the property. Um, there are concerns not only from, and the gentleman from Middletown Avenue is not here anymore, but there are concerns about what was going on in Middletown, uh, Middletown Avenue in the corner of Maple um, that uh, you know, when private developers come in and purchase town property or private property, um, that there isn't really a checks and balances through a number of boards and commissions in town. Um, but I think this is one that we should probably keep an eye on um, to make sure that any sale uh, does not um, you know, raise the building or um, alter it in any way that deems it you know, not historical anymore for uh, our district. So. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Um, I'll just report that I sat through the um, OPEB meeting this afternoon, the fireman's pension meeting this afternoon, and the town pension meeting this afternoon. Um, and all for all three of the meetings, the conversation was very similar. It had been a difficult fourth quarter in the U.S. and international equities. Um, so it was an off quarter and an off year, but the three, five, and tenure um, still showed growth and that we have had a strong January, which was good for market recovery. That's my <clears throat> report from pension committees today. Um, if nothing else, we will move on to B, discussion items. We have Sally Katz, our physical services director here. This is a state grant for the purchase of a physical services dump truck. This item's on the agenda for discussion. Thank you, Sally Katz, Director of Physical Services. Um, the town fleet, we have a suggested uh, replacement schedule for our fleet. In the fleet, we, one of the uh, dump trucks that we own is a 2006 Sterling dump truck. Sterling is a manufacturer that is now defunct. It went up, uh, it, it ceased operation uh, in 2009. Parts are no longer available for this, this type of truck. Um, knowing that we are in a replacement schedule, we saw an opportunity to apply for a one-time grant through DEP, through the state, um, who are receiving money as part of the Volkswagen diesel emissions settlement and th through that settlement, the state was given a certain amount of money to then give out to the use of um, cleaner engine vehicles um, for purchase. The diesel truck that we have, that is the 2006, because it actually has an engine in it that was manufactured in 2005, um, we qualify to be able to uh, go after this grant uh, for the replacement of the truck with a what they call a cleaner diesel truck vehicle. Um, surprisingly and very fortunately, we received the grant in uh, for forty nine thousand eighty six dollars, and that is it was it is close to a quarter of the cost of the vehicle. These trucks are very expensive. There is no getting away from that. Um, they last be around 10 years. Um, mostly they um, end up rotting out, uh, not from disrepair and not from care and maintenance and upkeep, but from the salts that they are used for spreading salt in the winter. They are used for leaf collection. They're used for bringing materials from the transfer station to the, um, to the stockpile. They're used for any of our other type of road materials um, and throughout the year. But it is mainly the salt that is a corrosive um, uh, agent. And um, this truck 
has had seen its seen its uh, part of its body starting to rot out. I do have pictures which we can send along at a, at a later time. I wanted to understand the time tonight. Um, and so utilizing the in the town materials, we have chosen a type of vehicle that would be appropriate. We have looked at the state contract. It's where we would purchase our vehicles. Um, and we are looking to have this discussion about moving forward. It is wonderful that we were uh, given and awarded this grant. The one stipulation is that we must um, take possession of a new vehicle in August, uh, which does not give us a lot of time to make a decision as to whether or not we want to move forward. But we wanted to present this to you to have some discussion about it, knowing that this $49,000 is quite a lot of money towards something that we know we will eventually need and actually have the need now to replace. Do council members have questions? Deputy Mayor? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Sally, you know, I, I see within your presentation you need to do something by February 28th in order yes. to be able to collect on this grant. Uh, you know, a one quarter savings is a nice thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Unfortunately, if we purchased this truck, it would be through a lease purchase arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the start of the budget season, because I know we started on a mm -hmm. CIP part already. Yes. But uh, on CNEF, uh, could prior to the next meeting when we'd have to vote on something like this, could you get us a list of the vehicles that you're recommending for the CNEF for the next budget? Uh, the cost of that and the lease purchase of that because you know personally I don't want to see our lease purchase and grant total going up for next year I'd like to see it stay stagnant or you know go down if we could so if you could get us that information before the next meeting when we'd have to vote on that I'd appreciate it yes we can and and the replacement of this truck was our is our it will be and is our number one ask Thank you. other council members Council Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Are there any other uh, vehicles that this $49,000 would apply to besides this truck? No. Okay. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Council Rell? I mean, so you're presenting it to us tonight with us to deliberate over the next two weeks to vote on it two weeks from now the grant amount again was forty nine thousand dollars yes from the state and it's the Volkswagen clean energy or, or diesel um, settlement yes the um, that kind of puts us kind of in a bind <laughs> uh, I mean we purchased the uh, or agreed to purchase the uh, the lift, and I know that had been on the table on the agenda for over a year. Um, I just tried to go back as quick as I possibly could, thinking about the purchases that we've done over the years, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the past year. If you can kind of refresh my memory, um, we. As you said, um, we re recently got approval to purchase the lift. Um, the other purchases that we've made of vehicles have been through the CNEF part of the budget from this year. Um, and so there was, um, there, were, there was a truck and some smaller pickup trucks, I believe, mm -hmm. from last year. Um, again, we've published or have given out our uh, replacement schedule. Um, we wanted to actually replace this 2006 in a previous year, uh, but because of budget constraints, we didn't and didn't have that go through. So it was going to be a part of this next ask uh, for this year um, because of the condition of the vehicle. And we're just always looking for opportunities to get money from places and this clean this clean energy grant became available in november 
And so we applied for it in hopes that we were going to see what, if anything, we could get. And uh, the fifty, the forty-nine thousand dollars was um, was recently awarded if we purchase. And that's just it. If we do not move forward with it, and I understand it is a very unusual request. The timing is really not falling into place the way that we want it. Um, however, if we choose not to move forward, then we need to mm -hmm. notify the state so that those funds can go to another town. We can't just keep them and right. wait until our budget mm -hmm. process runs its normal course. And mm -hmm. that is un uh, an unfortunate sidebar to this. Right. And the, the state kind of has us over a barrel when it comes mm -hmm. to that. And, yes, they do. <laughs> and unfortunately, they do when it comes to us having to cra uh, craft a budget in the next couple mm -hmm. weeks month month and a half right um it's tough right now not mm -hmm. knowing what we're going to get for um, state funding uh the governor's going to give his address the uh, february 20th kind of mm -hmm. give the the runs for the municipalities but again it's wide open after that until the legislature adopts a budget and then right. the governor signs it um which will probably not happen until after right. our may budget like it mm -hmm. always has um right now i gotta say you know this is a it's a big ask mm -hmm. and it's it's one of those where you know just to put it in you know layman's terms if you've got four gallons of milk and you got a coupon for you know buy four get one free what do you need a fifth mm -hmm. gallon of milk for just simply because you have a coupon for it mm -hmm. um is it that this truck is a workhorse we need it is it the the staple of the uh, fleet that uh, without this, you know, roads aren't getting right. sanded and plowed. To counterbalance your, yep. your example a little bit. Yes, this is a, a truck that is used for a snow removal route. So it does, um, it does have um, a designated route that anytime we do snow or ice uh, winter operations it is used it is used it has a route for when we do leaves um, it is one of the trucks that is out um, collecting leaves we also use it as I said as a hauler uh, during the year along with road work when we do our potholes and other road work during the spring and summer and fall months um, it's it's a truck that's like our other trucks they're used all year round because we don't have specialized trucks for that type of for the work it's whatever the work is for that season so now it's snow and hauling and mm -hmm. in the fall it's leaves it never sits no, uh unused right right and it is as i said to answer your question yes it is a truck that is used for a snow route okay. well. We'll have to think about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Forrest. Thanks. Um, Councilor Rell just sort of made me start thinking about a few things. I was looking at the c contract here that we were provided. Mm -hmm. I think this is the one from Freightliner. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. So a couple things come to mind. Is One is back in 2006, a car was purchased by a maker of Sterling. Mm -hmm. What is the concept that you have about procurement of services, particular trucks, that would protect against you know, purchasing an item that may become obsolete, not mm -hmm. necessarily because the item goes bad, but because of maintenance and so on. Well, um, we buy our trucks, just to let you know, off the state contract. So uh, vendors that they have vetted as part of their procurement process. So Freightliner right now is, um, Freightliner actually bought whatever parts were good of Sterling. Um, and so right now, Freightliner is, is the major manufacturer of trucks that the state has a contract with. Um, and so, um, does that answer your question? I'm not entirely well, sure. I guess in, in, your, in your industry, mm -hmm. there, you would think that there might be protections, sorry, right. that there, or, or how do you guard against protections right. against the purchases of certainly of large me mechanical materials and so forth, right. so that there's some protection of you, you then you can't be able to use it in a certain time frame because the company has gone out of business because mm -hmm. the parts aren't made because right. 
I mean, this happens in software a lot too, right? right? And so what is the, right. how do you It's a, It's a that? vehicle. It's just as right now, Ford is no longer going to be making some of its cars, but they're still warrantied. If they have a five-year warranty, they're still warrantied under Ford. These trucks come with five-year warranties, so they would be, they're <clears throat> warrantied under Freightliner. If Freightliner was to be bought by Volvo, then they would honor their warranties. We tried to utilize our trucks for 10 plus years by maintaining them, by washing them, by trying to get as much of the corrosive material out of them, um, by performing, as I said, both pre you know, preventative maintenance on them. Um, but they're always used, and they're used for very different types of activities. And 10 years is a pretty good lifespan for a workhorse kind of a truck. Um, and that's pretty much what we've gotten from this, from this vehicle. I noticed that the bid, it looks like, is about 207, 208,000. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yes, And then is. does that include a lot of those, I don't want to say extra because that doesn't sound like, but, you know, the, the snow plow, the mm -hmm. hooks, you know, all the materials that, for the jobs that need to be done with it. Right, everything is in this, we've, we've detailed everything in the bid. Are, are things like snow plows mm -hmm. and, and it involved as part of the 207,000 or is that different? That's, we can utilize the plows that we have. Okay. This is for the truck. Just the truck, Right, basically. and it's connections to the other equipment. Got it. And then the truck itself, that would that truck come out of, out of the fleet then or in sold? Oh, absolutely. In order to satisfy the grant, we actually have to prove that we uh, drill through the manifold and we literally take and we cut through the frame of the vehicle. That is, that is what we've had to do when we've gotten um, vehicles through this type of grant before. You have to prove that that vehicle is no longer capable of being put on the road and in use as part of a clean energy grant. But well, why wouldn't we sell it? You can sell it for scrap, but you cannot sell it to be used on the road. Why? Because that's the that's that's purpose the, of the grants, to get the, the clean the right, it's diesel a clean, it's a clean the diesel. They don't want it on the road. So you can, sell the, you can sell the truck for scrap metal, but you can't sell it to be purposed somewhere else. That negates the grant. And how much is the va that value? Of the truck? Sure. Not very much. I don't have a, I, I would have to get you the specific, I'm not going to, off the top of my head. Okay. Thanks. Are there any other questions or comments from council members? Okay. And what are you look, looking to move this to the next agenda? Was this simply for discussion tonight, or is yes. it the intention to move this to the agenda? <clears throat> or do we need a motion to move it to the agenda? Well, what we were looking at was just to get a sense from council whether this was even anything you would want to consider for, um, for because of the time frame we would be under if we were to accept the grant. So we didn't know if you felt it was something that could move forward or that maybe it wasn't the time to be looking at another truck when we haven't gone through the budget process yet. We just wanted to get a sense from council, from council what, what you might be thinking. So as not to bring it if you're not gonna support it or, or do more research and bring it and then discuss it in, at the next meeting. Okay, well I think um, the deputy mayor's questions about um, what other vehicles are you know on the CNEF list currently and if we could find out what vehicles we've purchased over this past year and what CNE, CNEF um, monies have been spent over this past year, those things might help us to determine whether or not a $200,000 dump truck is, is something that you know, we should consider for our budget. And the time frame is that we have to we have to order it by February 28th. Is that what I read? We we need to we need to place an order by the end of the month in order to have the truck at um, in order to qualify to have the truck on, um, available to us within the time frame of the grant. So we would order it by the end of February, mm -hmm. 
and it would come in after the yes. new, after July first. So we would be paying it out of the next budget. We, right. How does we, how would that work? We could do yes. We could um, put a letter to Freightliners saying that the town has agreed to pay for the vehicle um, when it when it comes due, and that would be. Um, post July 1st and when would you take delivery of the vehicle by August that's the that is the um, within the description of the grant that it has that we have to accept it by August 31st okay all right so then can we direct you please to get the, that information for us for the next meeting so we can make a decision? Right. Yes, we can bring that, all that information at the next meeting. And, and just to clarify, we would bring the physical services vehicle request for CNEF. CNEF encompasses mm -hmm. many other departments. Sure, and again, um, you know, a list of the vehicles that yes. we purchased this year off mm -hmm. that as well. Okay. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, next, we have the resolution in support of the MDC's integrated plan. And this is an action item. Do we have a motion? Yeah, uh, move to approve the resolution in support of the MDC's integration plan. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, so is there any discussion on this? Deputy Mayor? Uh, I read through this uh, plan by MDC uh, physically in a way it makes sense from the standpoint that they're pushing it out to do capital projects at the same time uh, to reduce emergency repairs and stuff like that. But the thing that I'm against and I'm going to vote no for this is because we've asked MDC in the past to you know, do what they can to reduce their budget. I went to the two budget workshops this year. You know, they didn't really listen to what we had to say. So my vote is going to be no on the principle of, yeah, this makes physical sense, but budgetary-wise, I don't think we can afford to pass this on to uh, our taxpayers at this time. Unfortunately, only one of eight towns, so our negativity really isn't going to have much weight, but I still want to get that point across to them. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilor Forrest? Just from a sort of procedural standpoint, are we, is this, um, are we acting on this today? Because this is sort of a workshop meeting rather than at a regular council meeting. As part of the um, regular workshop meeting, you have the ability to take action on any items. That's part of what was voted on for the ordinance for the workshop meeting. And just because timing, the MDC was looking to get this information and we put it on uh, for a potential vote this evening. How does the timing of this is a this is a this seems to be a, a you know a resolution expressing some of our thoughts on behalf of the municipality, but it's not required to do anything for the munis for the MDC itself. They don't need this approval to do anything or not do anything. So why is why would there be a any type of a required time frame or a, to do this? Well, they've asked that the council would consider it, and um, we did introduce it at the previous um, business meeting as part of the process, and now it's coming up tonight for a vote. Well, from an MDC standpoint, though, why does the MDC need this from us? The MDC has asked each member town if they would act on this resolution to support their plan as it moved forward to the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. So as part of their submittal to them, they were looking to show whether or not towns in the member towns would support this. Okay. So I, I suppose if we're moving forward, if we are, if it does come to a vote today, I have some concerns about the length, uh, the two concerns that I mostly have is that the length of time that they are looking to bond this over is tremendous. And it goes right in, I mean, my children who are six and four right now, are, their children will probably be born while we are still paying off this particular debt. And I have no problem, of course, with the ability to smooth out curves, 
not take a billion dollars and, and come up with that over the course of one particular budget period. And that's, of course, why we do the bonding, um, in order to smooth that out, in order to have a you know, reasonable ability to pay off very, very large sums of money. The importance of the MDC and the ability to have clean drinking water is the, the basis of society. So you know, establishing and spending money for that purpose is one of the reasons that I supported the Clean Water Project years and years and years ago. However, the way in which we are financing this over the length of it is something that is not something I'm comfortable with at all. If we need, as this generation, to pay our fair share in order to have clean drinking water for this region, then that is what we have to do as a basis of society. I'm not willing to put that off on my children and or wait that long for the work to be done and paid for for the protection of the environment and the protection of the natural resource. Secondarily, by extending it that far, we're also then pay, not necessarily using those dollars in the most efficient way because we're going to obviously have to pay the interest on that and the financiers that are back for, uh, that that would back those particular municipal bonds. So, because of those two reasons, I, it would be difficult for me to support this particular resolution as the way forward. Um, for us as a region, as a member of this, as a partner in this, in whatever form it takes, uh, to uh, I don't think this is the best use of our resources and the wisest way forward to protect the, the drinking water and the sewer water and the environment as it relates to pollution. It would be tough to support if it's going to come before us today. Thank you. Councillor Lesser? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, too, am going to vote no uh, for reason. Really, I want to send a message um, to the MDC that the way they budget uh, things and they come here a couple times a year and I agree with the comment that was made in the public I usually can follow the presentations pretty pretty easily their presentation is very difficult to follow uh, I think the way they continue to increase at uh, rapid and you could almost argue exorbitant rates each year notwithstanding the important work they do I would like to send a message uh, in terms of uh, I think they have to do a better job in terms of how much they charge the member towns and how much our citizens are paying. So I'm not going to support this resolution. Thank you. Council Hurley? Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, I think they just want us to support their high cost of doing business, and that's the only reason they have it up here. There's no other reason. And I also like the idea of maybe next time giving them a vote of no confidence. That would really send a message to them. Any other council members? Okay. Um, I, too, am uh, voting against this resolution and for the comments that have been made. I think that we talk a lot about how we have, um, you know, these, uh, these burdens that we are, we are facing from um, things that have not been paid for generations back. So why would we want to put this on our children and on our children's children? And I also think it does send a message to the MDC that we are disappointed with um, the continued increases that we receive. And although I do agree that this smooths out those increases, the length of time is just simply too long, in my opinion, um, for, for the bonding of these projects. So I, too, am going to vote against this resolution. Um, are there any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? All opposed? No. 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 Any abstentions? Abstention. Okay. Do you have that vote, Dolores? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. The resolution does not pass. The next item on the agenda is a tax deferment program to assist federal employees. Kathy, would you speak on that, please? Sure. We had put together this information that came out of the state legislature when they allowed towns to, uh, to be on a volunteer basis to look to assist federal employees when they were on the um, uh, down. shutdown. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and um, what, um, what we looked at doing was also to, at the time when we went through all this, the shutdown was still on and moving forward. And this, uh, this, uh, this program that we're pr proposing is for anybody that was affected by the shutdown that began December 22nd, 2018. That was what the state authorized if the towns wanted to put a program into place. 
it would be based on the shutdown that began December 22nd. So that would affect employees that might not be able to pay their taxes or the interest on their taxes because of the not being able to meet their bill, that the towns had the ability to go ahead and pass a, a policy that would allow, if they qualified, that they could defer for a certain period of time. Okay, thank you. And the deputy mayor has, is keeping me on track. We did not make a motion on this yet. Do I have a motion for the tax deferment program? I make a motion. Sorry. I make a motion to approve the Town of Weathersfield Tax Deferment Program to assist federal employees. And do I have a second? Second. Okay. Now, do we have any comments or questions on this, Councilor Hurley? Yeah, it's over, and I believe everybody got paid, so why wouldn't they pay their taxes? I just, I guess I don't understand. Isn't it, if it happens again? You know, we no, don't this know. Is, this is no, this one is time. this is for specific. I guess I don't understand. Time. We probably should have just taken it off the. Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Kathy, do we know uh, of employees who were impacted who may not have paid their taxes because they hadn't gotten paid until recently? Do we have? Do we know how many Weathersfield employees that uh, or federal employees that this may have impacted? We, we don't know how many federal employees might have been impacted. We know that um, we, I checked today and with taxes having been paid, uh, we have 713 uh, residences that have not paid their taxes. I can't tell you how many, I would not know whether or not they were federal employees. Thank you. So um, if we pass this, if they're one of those 713 or how many, 10 of them are federal employees, and they have not paid their taxes, this would waive their interest costs on being delinquent, is that correct? If they, if they qualify, so if you're a federal employee who had been working. If you know, you're a federal employee, and I know, you know, obviously we do have several in, in Weathersfield. So is that the intent, is that what would happen? So of the 713, whatever the number is, let's say there's 50 of them that are federal employees of the 713 that haven't paid their taxes, then we're excusing, if we pass this, the interest that would be due? I'm not looking at that right now. Yeah. Um, we would not charge them the interest, and then they would have, I believe it's uh, 60 days. Let me just double check. They would have a penalty not later than 60 days after the date on which an individual is no longer an affected employee. Well, nobody's affected. Do, yeah, they all got paid. But but they may not have paid their tax. They just got paid. Yeah, but if you get paid, you pay your taxes. That, that's not the way this is written. This is written as if the, the thing is still going on, the proposal. It's, it's, it's referring to a 60-day period from when the shutdown ends, which doesn't exist. I mean, this would have to be reworded. It just doesn't apply. So, Jack, could we ask the town attorney come up to come up to answer a couple questions on this? Did you work on this? This is the CCM proposal. Okay. So, uh, go ahead. Well, having you know read it, and I agree with um, Tony's uh, theory on this. That it, yeah, this is not. This reads as it would pertain that the current shut or the former shutdown is still ongoing. And I guess my question to our tax clerk who's not here is, is there typically a grace period anyways for if your taxes are due uh, January 1 and you don't pay those for 30 days, you have 0% penalty and then after 30 days, it, you know, you get a 1% up to 60 days, 2% up to 90 days. Is there any grace period at all? Not at this time. We've, that was January 31st. So now interest has, will start. And, and there's no way to quantify how many of those, and I'm sorry, 713. I guess we would have to know from our tax clerk um, 
how many typically don't pay their taxes on time? And, and it, it, is it because they are federal employees and the shutdown occurred and they didn't have the money at the time? Wouldn't they have called the town to say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an employee of you know, X, Y, and Z federal department and uh, I am currently not getting paid you know, can you give me some latitude? I mean, that that's what should have been done at the time that the shutdown was ongoing. Now that it is post-shutdown, which could actually be pre-another shutdown, so if anything, this should be reworded that would say during any shutdown, any federal government shutdown. But you open yourself up to uh, loan, or uh, not loan forgiveness, but tax forgiveness to just a select segregated class. I mean, what happens if you were one of the 713 and um, you lost your job? You, you, you know, you were laid off because your company moved from Connecticut to Massachusetts and you were part of 141 people that were let go. Um, why wouldn't we give them uh, some type of uh, amnesty? Um, I think Going down this road, even though it's, it, it doesn't make sense as written right now, according to what I'm reading, um, I think you're going down a, a dangerous path of giving uh, uh, amnesty to a segregated class. Um, if you're going to do that, you've got to do it to anybody who comes in. And I think the town does that, if, if I'm not mistaken. We, we hear uh, appeals and we hear of hardships from the public about um, their particular case and I think we we well I would assume that the um, tax collector considers those as a, a, a case by case basis um, I may be mistaken I've knock on wood always paid my taxes on time so I've never been in that predicament but I think these are questions that we should probably have of the of the tax collector before we vote on something like this. Sure, so it sounds like that it would be a good idea to table this and get some more information and determine whether or not it's even necessary. Did you want to make a comment or do you want to move to table? Are you making a motion? I'm gonna make a motion that we uh, table this for now and have the tax collector come to the next meeting and be able to answer these questions and any others that might come forward so we can decide uh, what we're gonna do. I mean, I don't know what the particulars are, Mike, but I know in the past when people are delinquent and have problems, the tax collector has worked with them on a payment plan so they could pay it off a period of time. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what that is, but she can explain that at the same time. Right. When she comes as well as all of this as well. Yeah, it seems to make sense. Um, are you making a motion? I made the motion that we table it to the next meeting. Do we have a second on that? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Uh, we have no ordinances and resolutions for introduction, so we move back into public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak on any topic, and please state your name and address. Come on up, Mr. Colantonio. Gas Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, regarding the physical services, I guess. You know, every time we come right here, there is some, something that we have to buy. The truck is only about 10, 11 years old. Personally, everybody that I talk to, mechanics and whatnot, uh, it's, it's like, you know, you get the most out of your vehicle when it gets older. So if we could work with this truck for a couple more years, forget it. That's the amount of the, of the grant that we're getting. I mean, a $200,000 truck, we get 25% there, it's, it's about $50,000. It's still going to cost us $150,000. <laughs> if we can work with this truck for a couple more years, I think it's, it's, it's worth it, you know. Uh, yeah, parts, I guess, they're going to be rare, but uh, you can find them. Uh, another, the mill rate. I was talking, you know, to some uh, town employees, I guess, a few weeks ago, and it's it came says, if you don't like this town, you can always move. Ah, I've been here since 1973. 
I've been paying taxes, and now if I don't like the way you guys behave, I can move out? That's not the way to think about it, personally. Going back to Morrison Avenue, I got about three and a half minutes. I've been complaining about it the last 10 years, and I know now that there is a meeting coming up sometimes, eventually, and whatnot. And I brought it many times now. Whenever I refer to Hillcrest Avenue, I'm only comparing Hillcrest Avenue and Morrison Avenue because they are adjacent and parallel to each other. By any means, I don't want anything to change on Hillcrest Avenue. I'm only addressing Morrison Avenue. And what did I say? In 1955, Morrison Avenue did not connect it to Silas Dean. So for all practical purpose, there was no traffic, true traffic. The width of Morrison Avenue, it's only 24 feet wide and a little bit less in certain areas. And Hillcrest Avenue, it's 30 feet wide. The setback on Morrison Avenue, it's only about 20 feet, the front setback with an, uh, I believe it's a 50-foot right-of-way. Hillcrest Avenue has an 80-foot right-of-way and a front setback of 40 feet. Stop signs. Hillcrest Avenue has one intersection with three stop signs. Morrison Avenue has two intersections with three stop signs. It's two to one. Have you ever asked yourself why? Maybe not. I wonder why. I let you be the judge for that. Grass strip. For most of the time, I can, Hillcrest Town is a 15-foot grass strip. Very safe, very safe road. Morrison Avenue at the corner or between Tifton and Orchard, there is no grass strip at all. With a mountable curb next to the sidewalk, because whenever the the town designed it, they did not really know what they were doing. When the sidewalk is adjacent to the road, the curbing has to be different, not a mountable curbing. The sideline intersection after the, before the construction of the sidewalk, there was no problem at all. Now the sideline intersection is not good for the posted speed. I told you before, I'm going to tell you again, and yet, after 10 years, nothing has happened yet. And yes, speeding, it's high. Since the sidewalk has been done, the road is smoother and everything else, and especially now, I'm retired. I see, I sit, watch TV, and, and I hear the noises, and I see the people going by, and yet, for the first time, if the chief of police is watching this, I'm calling him because a lot of people do not stop at the stop sign at the intersection of Morrison and Orchard. But I never called the police department to complain. But now, this is public. I guess I'm doing it. And, you know, having said all of that, you know, I'm going to give you another month here and there. We're going to meet with the town engineer. I want to meet with the police department. I want to do something. And if nothing gets done, I will not go away. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Come on up, Jim. Jim Clinch, 903 Ridge Road. I'd like to talk about Memorial Day. Um, about 15 years ago, 12 to 15 years ago, I, uh, uh, there was the uh, Democratic uh, mayor of New Haven was running for governor. I, for, I forgot what his name was. <laughs> and he came to John the... John DiStefano. Huh? John DiStefano. No. Oh. No, it wasn't DiStefano. Yeah, maybe it was. I think yeah. so. He ran against uh, former Governor Jody Rell. <laughs> <laughs> so, Who? so he came to the uh, Democratic Town Town Committee. Oh, if, before that, and on Memorial Day parade, he got a bunch of his supporters, and he and he just busted in and marched in the parade. And you know that's a no-no. 
the, the parade, Memorial Day parade for people that don't know is to honor the fallen, the people that have made the ultimate sacrifice. So when he came to the Democratic Town Committee meeting for the support, uh, he gave a little talk and I got up afterwards and I admonished him for doing that. And I, th I told him it was shameful and dis dishonest for him to do that. And he, uh, he came and apologized to me afterwards, but the damage was done. Then uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, a few years ago decided on Memorial Day evening that they were going to sh shoot fireworks. And uh, I wrote letters to the editor and I, I voiced my opinion that that this was not right, that Memorial Day is to honor the fallen, the people that give, made the ultimate sacrifice. And they still did it. They did it for three years. And not a peep out of any one of you people, nobody, everybody thought it was fine. The Chamber of Commerce. And finally, last year, they changed it to another date. So then last, last year at the Memorial Day Parade Committee meeting, the... Uh, the leadership announced that the Democratic progressive women, whatever they call themselves, were going to march in a parade. And I said, it's not a parade. It's not, not a parade that sh you should allow ple people with political agendas to march in a parade that, that, that honors fallen veterans. It's not right. The Democrats march in a parade because they're elected officials. The Republicans march in a parade because they're elected officials. But these people are advocates for, they have, they have an agenda, and it's not right. And I was overruled, and I resigned from the committee. And uh, I tell every veteran, don't participate in Weathersfield Memorial Day Parade because they honor. They don't honor fallen veterans. They honor. They have a. They have a political agenda, and that's what they're doing. And I think it's shameful, and dishonest for them to allow these people to march in a parade. Thank you. Anybody else who'd like to speak, Mr. Mazzarella? Good evening again, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. Uh, good night tonight. Maybe somebody's listening to me. Had your MDC resolution along the same lines that I was thinking. And uh, we tabled this truck for now, uh, or for further discussion. Uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about the replacement truck. As you know, I've spoken many times about this scheduled maintenance uh, replacement. And uh, we heard again tonight that uh, heavy trucks are now on a 10-year soft limit for retirement. And I just think that's entirely incorrect. Uh, there's no reason why that truck couldn't continue into service for, in service for many more years. We have uh, excellent town mechanics that service the trucks. I believe they do an annual DOT inspection where they would check the brakes and the chassis for corrosion and on and on and on. They make sure the truck is safe, uh, safe to continue to its next inspection. Um, if the Sterling manufacturer is no longer in existence, uh, I would propose that you run those Sterling trucks and I'm not sure how many we have, but I think it's a large number. I think the majority of the, our dump trucks are the Sterling trucks, 15, if I'm not mistaken. So we're not going to go out and replace all 15 trucks in the next couple of years because they're nearing their 10-year expiration date. Um, I just don't think that's the way you do maintenance. I've been in maintenance my entire career. Uh, I maintained a large commercial aircraft. Uh, old aircraft. Uh, we were able to maintain them under a budget, kept them in service for many years, had 99% dispatch reliability. Uh, when an aircraft has a problem, they don't pull over and call AAA, okay? They crash. So 
You can do serious maintenance, you can do it right, you can do it within budget, and you can extend the life of the vehicle. Now, if they develop uh, rust in the chassis, which is quite possible from all the salt, take the truck out of service and then go buy another truck. But if you get four or five, even three years more out of it, you're better off. The director of physical services says they have no value. I, I disagree. I looked online today, wanted to go out and buy a 2006 Sterling vehicle. Most of the vehicles have several hundred thousand miles on them. 560,000 miles one of them had on it. 800,000 miles one of them had on it. Those trucks were still going for $50,000. This truck that we're discussing had 4,354 miles this year, which comes out to 48,000 miles in its lifetime. So I think our trucks are uh, lightly used. Let's put it that way. Sure, they take some abuse, plow and snow, but they rarely see the highway. They rarely, rarely leave the town limits. So, and, and they're highly maintained. And now we can put them on a lift and we can do a better inspection. So I see no reason to take them out of service. The other thing I wanted to bring up, the, the whole thing of this uh, um, grant money was that we're gonna reduce our emissions. And, the uh, grant application states that Weathersfield has this uh, plan of reducing emissions and greenhouse gases. In this application, you'll note idling hours, annual idling hours, 752 in one year. 752 hours of sitting there idling. And I'm sure you've all seen the town trucks sitting there with the engine running with nobody around. They're doing something. They're taking a break. There's a law, anti-idling compliance and enforcement. The trucks are not supposed to run more than three minutes at a time between shutting them down. I suggest that you start enforcing that law. We can reduce our emissions. We can save some fuel and we could save some wear and tear on the vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I too, uh, was pleased to see that you at least voted down that MDC resolution and put the truck on hold. Uh, that truck and the way that money works, you know, if it came from a VW uh, settlement, I would have thought that the money would have gone to the VW car owners or vehicle owners. I don't know why it's coming to the town. Do you know why? No. I don't understand that. I would have given it to the, to, the, to the person that bought the cars that has a problem. Why give it to the town? They don't have them anymore. Well, still give them to them. They're, they're re it's, it's recorded somewhere that they, they owned it and now they got rid of it because it was a dumper or whatever. They're the ones that should have gotten the money and then there would have been no discussion at all here. No discussion on whether to buy or not to buy. And I, I, I don't think you really should buy. You should use what you have that's old and it's really not old. And uh, make it work. And you know, to me it looked, it sounds, sitting out here listening to that, it was like the state was doing economic development. They were, they were churning some money. And in the, in the process of churning the money, they were getting the towns who would have gotten this 49000 to go out on the hook again for more to go buy that full truck instead of a quarter of a truck. That's just the way I look at it quickly here. And uh, I just think it was a scheme, a scheme that the, the VW owners should have gotten the money and not the, not the t shouldn't have been done the way it's done. In any case, um, I, I just didn't think that was a good way of doing 
liquidating the money. So anyway, um, I know you have uh, some other things to talk about. I've been talking about the, the properties, and I've talked to you extensively from this podium about properties. I've talked to you about the dollars per acre that we've been see, that we see properties have sold for. And you know, I could, I could re recite some of those. Again, $22,000 sold in Windsor. $14,000 an acre sold in Manchester. $17,000 an acre sold in Glastonbury. $65,000 for a very small parcel in Glastonbury. $33,000 in Glastonbury uh, for another small parcel. Um, $46,000 in Glastonbury. And another one, $38,000. These are <laughs> sold properties. You can go online and look at them. They make your property on uh, Highland Street look terrible because it does look terrible. These properties are productive. And of course, and all, I spoke about the Roses Berry Farm where they had infrastructure set up, they had berries, they had all kinds of stuff going on, buildings irrigation systems in there, and, and they sold it for around $33,000 an acre. Yet you're buying something for 75000 I would urge you, and when you go through this list and think about all those different properties that I've talked about with low numbers, I don't see how your appraiser could possibly come up with that kind of a number. You know, the night of that public hearing, Mr. Forrest made a comment that he thinks, or it's probably um, fair market value. And I've been thinking that as soon as I read that and I heard that, he read that appraisal. He knows if that appraisal was fair market value. And it better be fair market value. Because, <coughs> but I don't see how in the world you're going to have that. And I know you're still holding back on that appraisal. You haven't released it to the public. And uh, I guess we'll have to wait if, until you decide not to buy the property and find a way to get out of it. Or you make the worst move you possibly can make by buying it. Remember this, folks. Think of the stock market. You look at the stock market every day you see it's boom, 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 and you see a real spike go up like that. Finish up, Mr. Then it young. comes back down and it bubbles along. What's going to happen is when you people buy that Keisha farm for $75,000 an acre, you're going to look at the, the, the cost of raw land going like this, and all of a sudden it's going to go way up there and come zooming down and continue as we go through the next weeks and months and years. <coughs> okay, thank this you will for be your a comments, blurp. Mr. Young. This will be Time such a blurp, madam, and it's going to stick out there like a sore thumb. Is there and anybody you'll be else? hearing from me forever and ever. Thank is, you very much. Is there anybody else in the audience who'd like to speak tonight? Okay, seeing none, we have an executive session. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? Motion to go into executive session. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>